Eric Salahub here, philosophy faculty and instructional coach, and I am here to give you part one of a video presentation of why we lecture and why we shouldn't. So I'm hoping you will sit back, um, enjoy the next 10 to 12 minutes while I give you some information about why we lecture. And I want you to think right and make connections. And so maybe you've got a pen and a pad of paper handy, or you're going to pause this video and pull up a Word document and do some typing, or you've got a laptop on the side. But I'm really going to encourage you to do some critical thinking um, during this 10 minutes. Um, what I know is that if you just sit back and listen, you will retain very little of what I talk about, um, and that's okay. But since you're here, um, may as well learn as much as possible. And so welcome. And I guess I would first just like you to think for a minute about um, to what extent you're a lecturer. You're here, so either you are one or you know someone who is one. And so just rank yourself on a scale of 0 to 10. Um, and there's no chat, but um, you can think about it. And it doesn't really matter how you're defining lecture. This is just a way for you to ground yourself in your own thinking about lecturing. So there are many different things that we might talk about in terms of types of lectures. Um, we will talk more about this uh, throughout this presentation. Um, but three of them that you might have in mind now are just kind of the standard lecture, what I'm going to call continuous exposition by the teacher. And that's what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes. I'm going to talk the whole time. Uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint slide, and you're going to be doing listening and taking notes or something like that. We also often do lecture discussions, and we do lecture of storytelling, and there are other sorts of lectures, but I just wanted to kind of give us a context to think about as we talk about reasons why we lecture. And so um, maybe you attune more or less to one of those types of lectures. And if you want to pause this video, you could certainly write about which one are you more attuned with and why. And if you want a challenge question, yes, those three types of lectures have some differences, but they also share some very profound common elements. And thinking about that might be worthwhile as well. So I'm a philosophy teacher, um, and I help my students learn about Socrates. And I have been known to attempt the Socratic method. And so why didn't Socrates lecture? Um, Socrates was living in Athens 2,300 years ago or so. And so he didn't lecture. And I've been pondering this. And I guess I'll ask you to ponder it as well. Um, there he is, engaged in the Socratic method, um, making fellow Athenians angry. So I want to frame our discussion um, in what I'm going to call the knowledge transmission paradigm of teaching and learning. Um, that's certainly the old paradigm. I think it's the current paradigm. And in a nutshell, this is the paradigm where we have teachers who are the content experts who deliver content and information to students who are the passive recipients of knowledge. And this transmission of knowledge paradigm really says the key role of teachers as content experts is to inform students and transmit knowledge from themselves to their students. And by knowledge, we really are generally talking about facts, content, and topics, although skills are clearly relevant here as well. So again, this is, I think, the current paradigm of teaching and learning. Uh, it's not all we do but this frames much of the way we currently think about teaching and learning and the way our students think about it. And I am here to help you attack the heart of the dragon. And but the dragon, I mean the knowledge transmission paradigm, and the heart of that dragon is the lecture. Um, it's not all we do, but it is pr the primary means of transmitting knowledge to students. And so we're going to attack the heart of the dragon without worrying that we're going to kill the dragon. 
Um, paradigms are extremely robust, and so I am not concerned that we are going to destroy the lecture um, in this uh, presentation today. But I am going to go for it because I think by really attacking the lecture, it will open us up to really thinking about um, the lecture in a meaningful way. Just know that I am not anti-lecture. Personally, I still do some lecturing, um, but I'm going to challenge you to think about uh, lectures in a critical way. So um, we've got the knowledge transmission paradigm that I think we're all familiar with, and then we've got what I'm calling the new paradigm, uh, the potential paradigm, which is the active learning paradigm. And this changes everything. Teachers become course facilitators and course designers. You know, we're here to what, facilitate learning. Um, students have to become learners. And while facts and content are still really important, um, the active learning paradigm is focused more on outcomes, content, or outcomes and skills. And so um, keep this in mind again in the background as we talk today. So why didn't Socrates lecture? Um, well, because he didn't have any knowledge to transmit. Um, Socrates said, the one thing I know is that I know nothing, and so Socrates admits up front that he doesn't have any knowledge, and there's absolutely no reason to lecture if you don't have any knowledge that you think is worth transmitting. Um, Socrates engaged fellow Athenians, and he was definitely a learner facilitator. Uh, he asked questions hoping that the person he was talking to would make progress and think and he would push them, but he didn't tell them anything. He helped them come to their own conclusions. Um, at least in theory, that's what the Socratic method is all about. Well, um, pretty quickly after Socrates, we get something that looks a lot like a lecture. And so this is from um, the 1300s, the early 1300s. Um, and this is an archbishop, so we're looking at the Catholic Church, and this is clearly an example of transmission of knowledge, and it is pretty darn important when the uh, students really need that knowledge, because if they don't have it, um, in this case, um, they're not going to go to heaven. And the only way they can get the knowledge um, is through this um, lecturer, right? This uh, content expert who has knowledge that these folks really need. And so this is a lecture. And the word literally means to read. And so this comes from the Latin. And um, the word was really used in the present format, you know, in the 1300s, uh, probably in that religious context. And then by the 1500s, it was really used in the same way we use it now. Uh, teachers presenting content to students, and so here in this picture we have an actual lecturer, and this is the University of Bologna, um, mid-14th century, and there we have the lecturer with the book, and these, I assume, are people who have a blank book, and they're literally um, transcribing, um, hopefully. He is transmitting the knowledge. This is before the printing press. Um, maybe one of these people has a book, but you can imagine the content is really important if there's only one book. And it's really critical that the lecturer who understands the content and who can read um, transmit the knowledge and these passive students are spending most of their time writing, uh, in theory anyway. So even here we have the people in the back room of the room talking during the lecture, uh, which is probably interfering with the transmission of knowledge. And this guy looks like he's bored or frustrated or asleep. And so um, more than 700 years ago, and this looks pretty darn typical of what some of us are probably seeing in our classes today. And here we have an uh, anatomy lesson. This is a dissection in public um, from the uh, early 1600s. And I'm going to call this a lecture because this is clearly an attempt to transmit knowledge and information uh, to students. And when I was pondering and thinking about this picture, I was thinking about Front Range Community College students at the Larimer campus um, who are taking 200 level anatomy classes actually get to go into a cadaver lab and do their own dissections. And so while a demonstration of 
uh, a dissection is probably something um, students get in a 100 level anatomy class, even at the 200 level community college, um, students are actually doing more than listening to a lecture about dissections, they're doing them. So why do we still lecture? Um, well, here we are at least a thousand years into the transmission of knowledge paradigm and we're still lecturing. And so conjure a mental image of a classroom with a, students and a teacher and really do it. Um, conjure this mental image or ask 10 people to conjure a mental image. Uh, ask some kids, ask some young people, ask anyone. And my sense is you're going to get something uh, that's pretty typical of the transmission of knowledge paradigm with a teacher at the front of the room and students out there listening and the teacher doing most of the work and the students being more passive. Clearly, that's not the only mental image, but again, I'm trying to evoke for you the power of the current paradigm and why we still lecture. And again, we're talking about all of these kinds of lectures. Um, they may be more or lesser extents of transmitting knowledge, but the key component of a lecture is it has to do with that person at the front of the room with the knowledge controlling the room and transmitting knowledge to students as a primary goal. And so one of the reasons we lecture is that um, that's what we do. We are parts of the knowledge transmission paradigm. We are critical parts of that paradigm. And being a great teacher means being a great lecturer. Um, a content expert who presents information and demonstrates skills to students. And so why do I lecture? because I'm a teacher and that's my job. And so we're going to look at a whole bunch of reasons to lecture. And so for each of them, maybe you just want to think about a plus. This is something that uh, I, that resonates with, um, that I resonate with. This makes sense to me. This doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense to me. Maybe that's a negative. The squiggly line in the middle, maybe you're kind of in the middle on this. Again, this is just my attempt during this lecture to engage you intellectually and so we're going to look at a whole bunch of reasons and I really want you to think about them and so I'm going to ask you to do some critical thinking and interacting and so I don't know is this a plus is it a minus uh, is this one of the reasons you lecture and again we lecture because it's what teachers do and that's the way our classrooms are designed with the podium at the front and the whiteboard and the, or the chalkboard and the data projector is pointing forward so we can use our publisher resources and our PowerPoints and project them so students can all be looking at the important content that we need them to see and um, you know we have lecture classes and those are intended to be lecture, right? And so maybe you teach in a lecture lab class. And so that's a class where, well, there's the interactive part, right? Where students are doing the work and you're facilitating, that's the lab. But even the lab classes often have a lecture component. So even if you're teaching welding or auto or um, dental or, um, you know, you name it, even these fields that we would think often as being hands-on types of classes, there is often a huge lecture component. And so I have seen almost every one of my colleagues lecture. It pretty much doesn't matter what you teach. A lecture is a significant component of what you're doing. And and because it's what we do, it's how we're judged. And so um, our supervisors, our department chairs, our deans, uh, our peers evaluate our teaching to a significant extent based on our ability to perform a great lecture. Um, when your supervisor or your peer or when you invite someone, your wife or your friend to come in and watch you teach, they're watching you teach, right? And so that's what you're doing at the front of the room. It's what's expected of you. Um, again, I'm trying to evoke the power of that current paradigm. We lecture because it's what teachers do. And I wonder how well this resonates with you. Um, and if not for you, what about the part-time faculty you work with or the new teacher who is um, 
trying to impress um, a lead instructor? Um, are they going to really work hard to perfect that really awesome lecture so when you come to class you judge them as a good teacher? Possibly so. Um, and beyond just it's what we do, it's what our identity is as teachers. Um, if you were a young person and you dreamed of being a teacher, you probably dreamed of being the person at the front of the room. Um, if you wanted to be a teacher but were shy, you dreaded being at the front of the room, but you knew that's what you were supposed to do. Um, you have favorite teachers, and all the role models and exemplars probably were lecturers, or certainly many of them were lecturers. And it's our identity because we spent all this time in school learning all these this you know information and all these skills, and we want to demonstrate and showcase our skills to our students. We think that's what our job is. Um, we are the sage on the stage, and it gives us a sense of power and control. Now, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily want that power and control, but maybe you do. Um, but like it or not, being at the front of the room, and I won't back up, but think about some of those slides with the archbishop or that teacher uh, with the raised podium and the dais and that power differential between who has the knowledge and who needs the knowledge and who controls the knowledge. And so, you know, part of your identity may be sculpted around that power and control that you have, even if because of your thinking about equity in the classroom, you realize that having the power might harm student learning, it's still an aspect of your identity, even if it's one that you don't like. And so if I'm asking you to change your identity to become a learner facilitator, um, that's a significant ask. Maybe it's about your ego. And again, Maybe that's not you, but I wonder how you feel about me suggesting that I want you to transition from a lecturer, a teacher, a professor, and become a learning facilitator. Um, it's not about you anymore. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, Ten years ago, when I heard the term learner facilitator, that was not something I was interested in at all. Um, I enjoyed being a teacher. That sounded like something good and um, worthwhile. Um, a teacher is to be held in esteem, and a learning facilitator seemed less than to me. Um, gosh, a learning facilitator seemed lower than a teaching assistant. At least a teaching assistant is an assistant teacher. A learning facilitator evokes that um, remedial nature of working with a directly with the student. I'm working for the student. Uh, I'm a tutor or something. And so, again, I'm going to challenge you to think about, are you hanging on to that lecture to some extent because it is about your ego? Well, I had my identity crisis five or six or seven years ago. Um, I was co-teaching a learning community with um, Carrie Mitchell, a fellow uh, faculty and colleague of mine in um, instructional coaching and active learning. And I was gone to a conference, and so I had her facilitate the class that day. She's not a philosopher, but she had taken, you know, sat through my class multiple times because we had taught together for many years. And I was gone. I let her facilitate an activity. I came back and she said, man, that was the best class ever. I've seen you do this in class and you were great, but when you were gone, they learned more. And that really it made us laugh, but it gave us pause to think. And then a few years later, we co-developed an online class and we designed it from scratch and it was the best class ever. And we saw our students learning more than ever. They learned more about philosophy. They wrote better papers. and. In our online class, there were no lectures. And so this was really what challenged my own identity. And I really had to struggle with the fact that when I was doing less, my students were learning more. And I guess as a learning facilitator, my students learned more. And it wasn't so much about me, but when I focused on the students, they learned more. And so this is the end of part one. What I'm going to ask you to do is 
take some time to think, um, do some free writing about whatever we've, you know, whatever's provoked you so far. Um, how do you feel about your identity? How much are you a lecturer? Which of those types of lectures are you doing? And um, come back for part two.